Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, a constructed response set on the topic of private markets pathway. We'll go ahead and do the learning module on private investments and structures. Notice there's an important word in that first LOS, calculate, and we'll probably interpret. We'll do a couple of calculations. They're super easy, uh, but they really play a big role in the context of trying to evaluate performance. And then we'll go ahead and do one final question on uh, on reporting. So let's go ahead and take a look at the case details. Silverstone Partners, $150 million growth fund, late stage technology investments. All right. Been operations in 2020, plan investment period of five years. So there's some uh, phases, 45 right away and then 35 30 25 and 15 so we'll put together a little table for you so look in that middle row there's the capital called all the way up through uh through the end of year four and then uh we'll go ahead and start with a net asset value of 45 of course that makes perfect sense right distributed capital has to be zero in in time period zero and then we adjust all, as we go out to year uh, four, five, six, and seven. So we're going to have to use this table to calculate some performance measures. A couple of other things that are interesting here in this case about uh, the practices of reporting. So we summarize quarterly report, um, event-driven reporting, and then comprehensive life cycle analysis. Uh, limited partners have recently had a discussion, requested more frequent reporting to match their public market portfolio. So you don't need me to tell you that uh, how important this private market is. Uh, and if I do need to tell you that, I'll just refer you to the very couple of first sentences in this learning module. The Institute tells us that uh, private market was worth about uh, $1 million over two decades ago. Now it's 11 or 12 or 13 million. I can't remember the exact number. You know, so it's expanded rapidly. It's expanded substantially. So of course the Institute is going to test us on this. Now, what did I say just a moment ago in those uh, learning outcome statements? We're going to calculate and calculate and calculate. So we'll have to interpret uh, We'll have to interpret those as well. And then the last one I told you, we'll do some reporting and we'll have to justify our choice. So let's go ahead and calculate the fund's PIC ratio at the end of year three. Remember, this could be done at the end of any kind of a year. Um, what this uh, PIC does, it tells us a little bit about the degree of the drawdown phase that has been completed up through year three. What this does, and this is important uh, in its interpretation, is that um, we can make comparisons across all different ty types of investments. So if we go back to the table, total capital required or invested or called through year three, we've got, let me go back here, yeah, 45, 35, 30, and 25. So that's our numerator. And then the total capital committed, so that's uh, 0.9. 90% has been called uh, by the end of year three, suggesting we're near the end of the investment phase. Let's go ahead and compute uh, the DPI ratio. So there's the cumulative, cumulative distributive Distributed capital, there's the D in, uh, in DPI. So let's go back over here. Total distributions through year five. So we can just go back to that table and there we go. Uh, distributed capital, 15, 30, 45, and 60. So let's go back here. Where are we? 15, 30, 45, and 60. So that gets us 150. Divided by the same, here, just keep in mind here, you know, it's the same 150. Uh, so we get a DPI ratio of one. So this is uh, indicates that at the end of five years, we've returned the exact amount. And by the way, one of the cool things about this learning module is that right before this section, there is, oh, I don't know, four or five pages in which the Institute reminds us how to calculate things like net present value and internal rate of return and return on investment. And then it goes into these very simple calculations and says something like this. So I think this is really important. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase a little bit. Although, 
Although these here, we, you know, we'll do this one here and then we'll do another one. We'll do the total here. Although uh, these performance measures do ignore things like time value of money, uh, they give us a extra kind of an insight into the performance of these unique private funds so that we can make uh, super comparisons. So re remember that for the exam. It does ignore a couple of different things that we know are really important for net present value and internal rate of return but they add some extra value that those measures uh, typically don't capture. So let's do the TVPI ratio here. Let's do, uh, this is just really the total of the unrealized returns and the realized returns, which we just did right here. So remember, all we're gonna do is throw that net asset value in the numerator and add the cumulative distributed capital in there. And we're gonna divide by the same thing. So we get 1.77. So notice that last part of the sentence tells us suggesting strong overall performance, 1.77. So that's a 70%, 77% higher than the paid in capital during that previous year. So this is all, this is all good stuff. What we can do is we can, here, let me go back here. We can use that one. We can use that 0.9. We can use this 1.77 to make direct comparisons that provide us with a little bit of extra insight on top of, I mean, we could do NPV and IRR as well. All right, let's finish up with this fourth one here. Um, which of those current reporting approaches is most appropriate and justify your choice? So do we like quarterly reporting? Do we like event-driven reporting? Do we like comprehensive reporting? Well, um, one of the cool things about the Institute and all of these readings is that it loves to repeat a concept and apply it in different areas. So once again, there are several pictures, several graphs in this learning module about the J-curve. And we've done the J-curve way, way back in level one. We did it with, you know, the business cycle. We did it with some other kinds of cycles. You know, the J-curve goes like this and then it goes up. And so in the very beginning, you know, so time is on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis is some measure of profitability. Maybe it's profit, maybe it's cash flow, you know, whatever it is. So what does that tell you? It dips below, it dips below the line. So the first phase in the J-curve is is that boy we've invested a lot of money and we're getting no return on it but then you know it hits the bottom and then it swings upward until it hits the mature phase so comprehensive reporting will capture that entire j curve effect from and i'm not going to go all the way back to the table at the beginning but it captures from year zero what did we go out to year seven in that uh in in that table also, it captures irregular cash flows and it encompasses full value creation timeline, zero to seven. And we have um, both uh, the investments in there and then the realization in there. So you have pluses and minus. If you remember correctly from our level one conversation, if you try to throw cash flows into your calculator, some have pluses and some have minuses, Sometimes you don't get an internal rate of return. So to avoid all that, you, you use this, uh, this kind of stuff that we're doing here in this, uh, in this case study. So why don't we like the other ones? Why does the quarterly report fall short? Uh, and this pretty much has everything to do with exactly its name. Quarterly reporting means that, okay, we got to put these out every three months. Well, that's short-term performance, short-term me metrics, which doesn't really coincide. I mean, it's probably perfectly fine if we're on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But remember, with hedge funds, with private equity, with private alternative investments, we've got illiquid assets and we don't have a timeline. And there's some other unique constraints in these types of investments. And so, uh, and there we go, look at the middle one, limited valuation points. That's why we don't like quarterly reporting. How about event-driven uh, reporting? And so that focuses on an event, let's say it's some type of an event, and that event is probably, let's say today or next week or last week. And so uh, we miss out on the entire spectrum of increasing long-term value and remember, we can go back to Harry Markowitz in 1952 and the economists that go all the way back to Adam Smith in uh, in the 1700s, you know, where consumers and now investors, they try to maximize end of period utility, which is essentially what we're doing here. So, you know, that uh, event driven report probably ignores all that good stuff. What do we have in the middle there? Miss, miss the broader context. 
And that was a pretty short case study. So we did a bunch of good calculations and we talked about reporting. So this was a good one for us. So, hey, thanks for watching and good luck studying.